Uh, today, I'm going to be talking about esoteric web application vulnerabilities. Basically, that means strange vulnerabilities. Vulnerabilities which are uh, difficult to identify and sometimes difficult to exploit. A little bit about me. Um, I work doing source code reviews and application penetration tests, and I've been doing that for like 10 years. I uh, am a developer, I code in Python, and uh, some people know me for the W3AF uh, project. That's uh, an open source web application security scanner, but I'm not going to be talking about that uh, today. And uh, I use open source and stuff. So let's first uh, try to understand why these complex vulnerabilities are important. Um, SQL injection is going to die soon. Frameworks like Ruby on Rails, Django, and uh, many others are all using ORMs. So if you're a developer and uh, you are uh, coding a new application, you're not going to be writing a uh, select statement on your own. You're going to be using an object, and you will write something like object dot uh, select, object dot find, and uh, if you use that, it's very difficult to have SQL injections in your web application. So, SQL injections right now they are becoming rare. And uh, something similar is uh, going on with cross-site scripting. If you use modern web application development frameworks, most likely that framework uses a templating engine. And the templating engine is going to help you, the developer, avoid cross-site scripting. And uh, basically that happens because if you have the template like this, the templating engine, when you do something like this, user.url, and you use the curly braces there in order to print the value of that variable, it's going to, by default, HTML encode your variable. So if you are a developer and you write this, there is no cross scripting. You need to write extra code like adding a pipe raw or a dot HTML safe or something like that in order to add a cross-site scripting to your application. If we take this into account, we are going to notice that kind of the common vulnerability types are slowly going to disappear. So we need to find new things. And those new things is what I want to talk about. And of course, I don't care about those uh, boring vulnerabilities disappearing, because I want to find interesting things. I want to actually use my brain. I want to outsource the detection of the boring vulnerabilities to tools and use my brain for something fun, interesting, challenging. So I'm going to walk you through five different vulnerabilities. Uh, this don't have anything to do, uh, any, any relation between uh, the, the vulnerabilities. Um, so just let's start with the first one. Aggressive input decoding, which is going to lead to no SQL injection. This aggressive input decoding is something that happens at least in Ruby on Rails, but uh, I believe it also happens in uh, development frameworks in Java and uh, Python. So let's see what happens. First, we have the source code for the HTTP request handler. That, that source code is a code snippet from um, a Ruby on Rails application. And what happens there is that we have the params variable. This variable is going to be filled 
with whatever the user sends in the HTTP request. And uh, the interesting thing here is that Param is going to be filled with different sources of information. For example, if we send the information in your encoded form, it's going to end up there. Or if we send it in application JSON, it's also going to end up there. And if we use uh, query string parameters, guess what? It also ends up in the params uh, variable. So that's good. It's a feature. Uh, developers are going to use it in order to uh, abstract the sources of information. But uh, there is something interesting which uh, we could do, and that's uh, sending an HTTP request with a post body like this. And uh, if you noticed before, what we were seeing there is that the name variable was a string. And now we are modifying it a little bit, and uh, the type of that variable right now, it's a hash. It's a Ruby hash. That's a good, that's a good feature. Let's uh, move into something different, and then we'll add up these two things in order to get a vulnerability. Um, when you use uh, a Mongo database in your Rails application, you're going to most likely be using something called Mongoid. Mongoid is just like a driver around a Mongo database, which is going to allow you to query the documents that you're storing there. Um, it's just like uh, using an ORM for SQL. You use an ODM, such as Mongoid, for Mongo databases. Um, so if you're writing a Ruby on Rails application, you use Mongoid, and you're going to have a code similar to this one. You'll have the registration model, and you're going to query the registration model using this syntax. In the syntax, you say, all right, I want the registration where the user is this one, and the confirmation token is this other token. If you're using burp, or if you're using any other proxy to intercept the HTTP request, you're going to see this request, which is handled by that code. Um, everything works. That's just a feature. And let's understand how a developer could perform a little bit more advanced queries into the Mongo database. That's going to be performed, for example, like this. Users were your user ID is something, and the country is not equals Argentina. Or user ID is in a list. So I suspect that you guys see where this is going. Basically, what we could do as part of our attack is to combine the two different things. Combine the aggressive input decoding that we saw before, with the NoSQL injection and the filters that we were seeing. So if we have this code and we send this request, what's going to happen is that here we are forcing, and actually with the application JSON and with everything, but specifically here, we are forcing that uh, the value of the token uh, variable it's actually a hash. That hash is passed here. And uh, the, the developer was not expecting this. So what happens is that you're able to uh, complete the registration without knowing the token. That's uh, a specific case of a NoSQL injection, which is possible because of what I mentioned before. All right, any questions? Cool. So how do we fix this? Developers need to fix it because 
it's serious. It's something that uh, can be exploited. It's something that can be detected using uh, source code review, can be detected using uh, black box testing. Um, and uh, depending on the context, this can be exploited to get kind of serious things. So in order to fix it, developers need to add to each params a dot to string. That's going to transform whatever comes from the wire and whatever is decoded from the HTTP request, it's going to transform it to a string. As you can see from this, the fix is not complete. The fix is actually really bad. Developers are going to forget to add the dot to string to every params that they take. So there has to be a different way in order to fix it. And there are two different ways which are complete and more uh, kind of architectural solutions to this issue. The first one is to use Sinatra Panam. It's a gem that you use in Ruby on Rails, which is going to allow you to perform strict input validation. So each of your uh, HTTP request handlers is going to have kind of a header that says param's name needs to be a string. And if you don't do that in your HTTP request handler, you get an exception. So that's a good way, because in each of your HTTP request handlers, you need to define the types of the variables. If you don't do it, it's going to break. So that's good. And uh, there is another way, which is to use something called strong params. That's uh, basically the way that Ruby on Rails uses to fix SQL injections, but ported to Mongo databases. Also, that's a gem. You need to use it. You need to integrate it into your project. And it's going to prevent uh, tainted variables to go from the user to the database. OK, next one. Um, I was uh, doing source code review of uh, an application. And this application had two-factor authentication. The two-factor authentication was done using a phone call. So when a user wanted to perform a specific action in the system, the application simply called the registered number for that user. And uh, after doing that, you picked up the phone. And over the audio from that call, the application told you a code, you got that code, and you entered the code into the application. All right? So as part of uh, this test, what I wanted to do was to bypass this two-factor authentication. Um, and the, the system, the, one of the things that it did was when you created a new user, it has to verify that you actually owned that phone that you were associating with your account. So the vulnerability that I'm going to tell you is in that process, in the process of verifying that you actually have your phone with you and that you are not associating a random phone number. OK. So uh, basically, the user says, please verify my phone number. The vulnerable web application goes to a software as a service. This software as a service is the one that actually makes the call. This is something like Twilio, for example. Uh, Twilio is going to perform an HTTP request to the vulnerable web application asking for the audio for this call because Twilio doesn't know what you want to send in the audio for the call. And uh, finally, Twilio or any software service is going to perform the call 
And once the phone call is connected, it's going to send the audio with the code. So the user sends the code to the application, and the identity is verified. I try to uh, identify different vulnerabilities in this process. I tried, of course, to perform uh, brute force of those codes, and it was not possible. After the third uh, try, it simply asked me to enter a CAPTCHA. After the try number 10, it blocked my account. So it was OK. Um, I tried kind of different uh, ideas, like, all right, I could maybe verify the account of, uh, verify the phone number of a different person, like hacking the smartphone for another person and stuff like that, but it was kind of complicated. So the best uh, choice that I had was to, use, was to hack the vulnerable web application, which was my actual target. Um, so I said, all right, I'm going to try to uh, directly access the URL from which the phone call audio comes from. Um, and uh, the URLs looked like this. These URLs were randomly generated here using a unique ID. And uh, as an attacker, I wasn't able to know the next unique ID. So it was impossible for me to perform an HTTP request and get the audio for a user. And even if I was able to do that, I had no idea uh, if I get this, the code that I get from that audio, I don't have any idea for which user it is. So it's kind of useless to just brute force this. So I started to investigate. I was doing a source code review, and uh, I said, all right, let's uh, try to understand how this works. From the vulnerable web application, there is an API call to the software as a service that performs the outgoing calls, and it looks like this. It's a phone number, and the audio callback is in this URL. The audio callback is where the phone uh, audio is, of course. And uh, I was digging a little bit further into the implementation, and I identified the vulnerability somewhere in those lines. Who can tell me where the vulnerability is? The callback URL is, yeah, it's a parameter for start call, but I, as an attacker, cannot control all of callback URL. I can control a part. With the host, all right. So here's the vulnerability, and how can we exploit it? We can exploit it by changing the original HTTP request to something that looks like this. So I change the host to evil.com, and what happens next is that instead of uh, Twilio going to the vulnerable web application to get the audio, it will go to my application, like evil.com. From evil.com, I, I get this unique ID, I go to the vulnerable web application, get the audio, get the code, and then send it back to Twilio, and Twilio it doesn't actually know what happened there. So um, this was possible because of two different reasons. First, the developer used request.host in order to create a callback URL. That's usually a bad practice. Then something else is that the web, uh, the web server in front of the web application was not properly configured. So if your uh, 
in production and you're serving our application, you need to define a white list with all the domains for which you want to answer HTTP requests. So if you have Nginx, for example, you just create a white list with all your domains, and for the domains that uh, are outside that list and for which you receive HTTP requests, you just drop them. Uh, also, um, in this uh, scenario that I was testing, um, it was a Django application, and it was poorly configured, because in Django you have something called uh, allowed hosts. Allowed hosts is a list of hosts for which you want to answer HTTP requests. And uh, that was poorly set. So because of all those reasons, this was exploitable. Did you guys follow me? Yep. All right, next. So password resets are really sensitive. And uh, developers tend to make mistakes in password reset implementations. So if you're ever doing a source code review, spend time in password resets. Um, the good thing about password resets is that even tiny mistakes, like the ones that I'm going to explain to you now, might lead to uh, account compromise. Um, so just uh, to freshen up your mind, uh, in case you never uh, forgot your password for any application, um, when a user wants to uh, perform a password reset, what happens is that the user goes to a web application, he clicks, I forgot my password, and he chooses, uh, he enters his um, email address, and uh, the application is going to send an email to an email address with a link for the password reset. That link is going to contain a token, uh, randomly generated in most scenarios, a randomly generated string that's going to be used to reset the user's password. So the implementation actually looks si similar to this. We have two different parts, the start password reset, which is the HTTP request handler that's run when the user enters his email address. This is start password reset. And the second part, which is complete password reset, that's when the user uh, sets, uh, like follows the link that was sent in the email and sets his new password and the token is received, the new password is received, the password token is reset, and so on. So this is the implementation. And what we are seeing here on top is the database um, attributes or columns that we have in the user model. So for this to work, what needs to happen is that the user will have uh, the user model in this application will have an attribute, and that attribute needs to be the password reset token. This password reset token is just the unique ID that's sent to the user's email. So in the user model, we add, in the user model, we add a new column called password reset token. That's a string, and we default it to nil. This nil here in Ruby is going to be translated to a null in the database. All right? So let's uh, just imagine that this is a MySQL database that the Ruby on Rails application is using. So this nil translates to null in the, the MySQL database. Um, so start password reset, complete password reset, Basically, start password reset, what's going to happen is 
that based on the email address provided by the user, we generate a random token, we set the token in the model, and save it. That goes to the database. Finally, we send the email to the user, and by sending in that email, we send the token. And uh, here, what we see is uh, the second step, which takes the token, sets the new password, sets the password reset token on nil, and saves the, the model, and signs in the user. So there's a vulnerability there. And the vulnerability is a little bit hard to identify first. But basically, what's possible to do by knowing that Ruby or else is going to perform this kind of aggressive input decoding that I explained before, is that an attacker can send token null. That token null is going to be translated into um, here, params token. This is going to be nil in Ruby. And when it's sent to the database, it's going to be null, like null, N-U-L-L. -L. And uh, what happens here is that when an attacker sends this HTTP request, this query to the database is going to return the first user in the database for which the um, password reset token column is null. And uh, we said here that by default, all the users, all the new users in the system have null. So by sending this HTTP request, an attacker is resetting a random user password to let me in. The good thing about uh, this complete password reset uh, implementation is that the last step is to sign in the user. Because it makes sense, kind of, it's OK. Because uh, if you know the token, it's because you received the email and you're the owner for that email address, so you are the user. So why not, in the complete password reset, we just sign you in? Um, so this was a real case, and I was able to uh, run this a couple of times, and I got access to uh, the first 10 random users in this application. I didn't know exactly which users they were, but I just run this. I got access to the user's account. By gaining access to the user's account, I got access to the user's email. I started a new password reset flow for that user. That changed the column, the password reset token column in the database for that user to something different of no, and then run the attack again. That was going to choose a different user than the previous time. By repeating that, an attacker could gain access to multiple user accounts. Basically, all of the user accounts that don't have a password reset flow uh, in progress. OK, how to fix this? Uh, there are two ways of fixing this. Um, this, as I said, I don't personally recommend it because it's very easy to forget to do this two-string cast. Uh, or the other way is setting a good default for the password reset token. A good default in this scenario means something that's not no. All right? Cool. OK, so something that I really love is integrations between merchants and payment gateways. So developers uh, are always under pressure. Uh, 
project leaders are uh, like uh, pressuring them in order to deliver features, and uh, usually they don't care about security. And uh, that's shown always in these integrations with third parties, where, for example, we are going to see uh, that's possible to perform something called a double spend. So let's see how it works. Um, when you're on a merchant site and you have a pay with PayPal button, what's going to happen is that the user clicks on that button, goes to PayPal, pays for the services or the goods that he's trying to purchase, and uh, if everything went all right, the browser is redirected back to the merchant site, and you see a page that says something like, thank you very much, uh, thank you for your purchase, uh, in three days you're going to receive your goods, your shoes, your t-shirt, whatever you bought. Um, behind the scenes, something that's going to happen is that PayPal is going to send an event to the merchant. That event is going to be sent under a protocol that's called IPN. IPN is a way in which PayPal sends a lot of data to the merchant using an HTTP POST request. And uh, all of those uh, pieces of information that are sent from PayPal to the merchant are very well documented and have a lot of kind of tips and tricks which you, the developer, need to implement in order to make that IPN implementation secure. Um, so how is this implemented? Basically, if you're the developer, you go to your PayPal settings and you say, okay, I want to receive my IPN uh, messages, events in this URL. And you, the developer, need to code something here in PayPal Handler. And that PayPal Handler usually looks like this. Like, like we said, the user clicks on pay with PayPal, the user goes to PayPal, and then pays uh, using his credit card, and PayPal sends and post a post request to the IPN handler. And what should happen next, and uh, that's something that in some cases is forgotten by the developers, and it's a completely different vulnerability, is that the developers don't check that the request that they received is actually from PayPal. So in a secure implementation of the uh, IPN handler, what a developer must do is everything that he received here from PayPal, he must send it back to PayPal and verify it. The verification process is just to avoid that an, an attack in which an attacker is going to send arbitrary data in order to fake a payment, okay? Uh, so in this verification, PayPal says, all right, verified, and the payment is processed by the merchant. This HTTP request that goes from PayPal to the merchant looks like this. It has a lot of parameters. The ones that we are going to care about are these four parameters. We have the gross amount, which is the amount that the user paid in PayPal. We have the payment status. Basically, it means that the payment was successfully uh, made by the user and uh, the charges were uh, made to the credit card or not. Like completed means yes, and incomplete or unsuccessful means no. Then we have the receiver email, the receiver email address, this, and custom. So the receiver email address is the email address for which 
the uh, event is for. So when PayPal receives a payment, that payment is for a specific PayPal account. That PayPal account is this one. Finally, what we see here is a custom. Custom is basically a way for uh, the merchant developer to track payments. So when a merchant creates a new button on their site uh, and the user clicks on their site, they go to PayPal. And there, as a developer for the merchant site, you lose track of all of the payment that's done here in PayPal. There, you need a way for tracking the IPN event with the user that clicked on the button. So as a developer, you use custom. Custom, in most scenarios, is the user ID in the system, the user's email address, or the uh, ID of the card that's being created. So this custom is basically the user's ID. Uh, and we already talked about this, all right? The verification process. In this case, we have an insecure IPN handler. This insecure IPN handler performs all of the steps that I talked about before. It basically receives all the parameters that we saw on the previous slide. It will go to the PayPal URL and send all of the parameters again. In the response, it will check if it's verified. That means that all of the received parameters are OK for PayPal. And if it's verified, then it processes the transaction. Otherwise, return an error. Who can spot the vulnerability there in that slide? Perfect. All right. So I'm going to explain what he said in slides. Uh, you didn't listen, but he was completely uh, perfect in his uh, vulnerability description. So what's missing here? What's missing is a check to verify that the event that we are receiving is actually for our merchant account at PayPal. What could happen here is that an attacker can follow these steps and perform a double spend. And the steps are, first, the adversary or the attacker creates a new PayPal account. He configures an IPN URL pointing to evil.com. He creates a pay button using custom equals unique purchase ID. This unique purchase ID or the user ID comes from the merchant site. And that needs to match in order for everything to work. Because if they don't match, uh, this params custom is not going to work. That line is not going to work, so they need to match. Uh, then what happens is that the attacker is going to create a payment to himself. He's going to use the pay with PayPal button that he just created. And using the attacker's credit card, he's going to pay money to himself, to his PayPal account. So that happens here. When he does that, PayPal is going to send all of the IPN data to his IPN URL. The attacker receives that information, and he sends it back to the merchant. That should be the other way. So the adversary sends the information that he got for his merchant, all the event for his merchant, and he sends it back to uh, the vulnerable IPN handler. 
because the IPN handler is not verifying the receiver email, what's going to happen is that it will send back the information to PayPal and the event is going to be verified and the payment is processed. Uh, this is just the same thing that I explained before. And the fix is this. As a developer, you need to add this line in order to check that the receiver email that you get in the parameters equals to the merchant email address in PayPal. Okay? Right. So, one of the most common questions that uh, you received after explaining this is, is this PayPal's fault? And uh, actually, the answer is no, but maybe yes, because their API design was poor, and because of that poor API design, they are uh, kind of moving the responsibility of checking and making security decisions to the merchants. And let me explain this with a secure MPI design. So I work for some guys in Argentina that created uh, something called Mercado Pago. Mercado Pago is a payment gateway similar to PayPal. And uh, what they did is to create a different IPN protocol. In the IPN protocol that they use, when a new event is uh, triggered by users paying in Mercado Pago, what happens is that instead of sending all of the information from Mercado Pago to the merchant, what these guys do is just to send an ID, an ID of that event. What happens next is that the merchant needs to get that ID, get the API key for Mercado Pago, and uh, go query the API for uh, Mercado Pago events. From that API, they get all of the information. So even if an attacker is sending events to that IPN handler for Mercado Pago, what's going to happen is that when the merchant queries the API, the API is going to send, is going to say something like, no, you don't have access to this event. This event belongs to a different user. And that's right, because it belongs to a different user, because I was trying to make an attack. So PayPal made an incorrect design decision which lead, which leads to these types of vulnerabilities. Okay? Great. Last one. Let's check how much time I have. Cool. Number five. So, in uh, Ruby on Rails, there is something called Active Support Message Verified. Message Verifier. Um, which is a feature of uh, Ruby on Rails, which allows you to take a message, sign it, and then if you want, on the other side, take the message and verify its signature. The problem with uh, the message verifier is that it could lead to remote code executions. And uh, I found two different uh, instances of this vulnerability in independent uh, source code reviews. So once you sign a message, the result looks like this. The result is the base64 encoded version of the message here, dash, dash, and the signature. And the messages can be decoded. So you get, it's not encrypted, it's just signed, and it's base64 encoded, so you can take the message, 
it has some things there which are kind of indicating that it's not a simple string that's uh, encoded there. And it's actually marshaled and unmarshaled. So one of the cool features of message verifier is that you can sign and serialize or marshal any object. So if you have, for example, um, an array, you have an object, you have almost anything in Ruby, you can serialize it, sign it, and send it over the wire. Um, so the serialization process is done using the Marshall uh, module for uh, Ruby. And uh, as you guys might know, if we have been doing uh, source code reviews in uh, Ruby, what happens is that, um, and uh, this, sorry, I expect. What happens is that uh, the Marshall uh, module is kind of insecure because in the documentation it says something like this. Uh, unmarshalling arbitrary data is insecure and will lead to arbitrary code execution. So as an attacker, what's uh, preventing me from creating a specially crafted string that's going to be unmarshaled by the application when it receives this message. What's blocking me is just a secret that was used for signing these messages. So this secret depends on the developer. And uh, in the two cases that I identified, one of the uh, secrets for used for signing these types of messages was hack me, I feel lonely. And the other one was the user's ID, which was a number, like incremental number integer. Um, so as an attacker, what I can do is to follow the steps. Just brute force the secret until I identify it or if maybe I know it somewhere, somehow because I gain access to the source code or something, then as an attacker, you create a specially crafted gadget. That gadget is basically going to be an object serialized using the Marshall uh, protocol that uh, when you unmarshal that object, it executes an arbitrary comment. Then, using the secret that I got from step one, I signed this gadget, I do base64, and I send it back to the application. When the application gets that message, it's going to verify the signature. That signature is going to match because I got the right secret. And uh, afterwards, the application is going to unmarshal the string and remote code execution, OK? So this uh, vulnerability is similar to uh, ones that you might have seen in um, Ruby on Rails cookies. Uh, if uh, the secret for a Ruby on Rails application is uh, disclosed, then you can follow kind of the same steps here. And uh, the vulnerability is fixed by using long secrets for signing messages or even much better, using a different serializer. So message verifier takes a seri optional serializer uh, parameter. By default, the serializer is Marshall and unmarshal. And uh, if you use serializer JSON, what you're, you, what you're saying there is that instead of using Marshall, you use JSON, and there is no known vulnerability that's going to take you from um, unserializing JSON data to remote code execution. So the fix is to have long secrets 
and to change necessary license. So basically, that's why I don't care. I don't care about uh, kind of silly vulnerabilities and boring vulnerabilities disappearing. Um, you guys shouldn't care either. This is much more fun than a SQL injection. And uh, you are smarter than your tools. Let your tools perform the automated work. Let your tools try all the cross-site scripting uh, tests on all of the parameters. And use your time to perform source code review and identify these types of vulnerabilities. Usually, you are smarter than your client. Try to convince your client to provide you with the source code. You are going to find more vulnerabilities, and your security assessments are going to be much more valuable. And uh, finally, you are smarter than the developers, or you know more about security than the developers. And you're going to be able to identify these vulnerabilities and many others that they are going to keep introducing even if the framework is protecting them against cross-site scripting and SQL injections. So that's uh, my Twitter account, my email address. Thank you. <laughs>